<laughs> found this baby at Walmart with cats all over it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Hey, was that a great video? Uh, that's my favorite video. Uh, it's called Instead of Bohemian Rhapsody, it's Bethlehemian Rhapsody. And, uh, and so if you want to find it on uh, YouTube, it is there for you. Uh, that was my favorite. She did a great job. She did a great job on the Bible reading, huh? <laughs> hey, this, uh, this evening I want to look at, we're going to simply uh, focus in on one thing, and that is the gospel of Christmas. Gospel simply means good news. We live in a time where we talk a lot about news, we enjoy news, we like local news, we like international news, we don't like fake news, uh, there's a whole lot of bad news. And so we're just tonight, we're going to talk about good news. It's nice to focus in on good news. And so that's where we're going to, uh, to land tonight. Matter of fact, in that first Christmas, the angels show up in the sky, and that's what they talk about. And that's where we get this from, Luke 2.10. Don't be afraid, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. And so the Bible comes out and just calls it that. So right at the beginning of, we don't even know what the good news is. They're saying whatever's coming, it's going to be all about good news. And so that's what we get to focus in on. You think through that first Christmas, though, and you think, well, how is this good news when you have a, a baby being born in an animal shelter by a teenage gal and visited by some no-name shepherds? What is the good news in this? What's the, what is the point of the Christmas story? What is its purpose? What is its news? What is its good news? As a hint, one of the Christmas carols that we sing says, Christ by the highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. And that's really the answer up front is what is Jesus. He is the good news, this good news that came down to earth for us for a purpose. And we'll talk about that, that purpose but I think you have to focus in on good news because we're all living right now. Each and every day you have bad news and good news. As a matter of fact, you go up to a friend and you say, hey, how's it going? And depending on the friend and the timing of that and everything else, there's some that just immediately go to bad news. Here's all the bad things. Here's my list of all the bad things that are happening to me right now. And I think it's when we choose to overlook all the bad things and focus in on the good and I was thinking through that first Christmas story then, and uh, in just a moment we're going to be looking in at that first Christmas, and we're going to find the good news from each of their different perspectives. Plenty of bad news that first Christmas that was there. A matter of fact, God did Christmas right in the midst of chaos. We have uh, Rome, and it's running the empire at the time, and the Caesar comes up with this decree for a census want everybody to go back to the city that they were born in and uh, check in there. So imagine the chaos that, that throws in. If right now you picture, okay, all of us have to go wherever you were born. I was born in Whittier, uh, prettier Whittier. And so if all of us had to go home, so pretty soon you'd imagine the panic, the high stress, very chaotic time. People are thinking of themselves, the taxes, getting to where they needed to get to, booking their hotels on Travago or, you know, whichever, you know. After using it, and, and so with that, they're getting it all set. Christmas season, let me say this, Christmas season is usually chaotic. It wasn't the very first one. So we're kind of surprised in our day and age today. It's like, why is it always so busy and crazy? I'm asking that every year. I think it just is. It was for the very first one. But again, what are we going to focus in on? The bad news or on the good news? I hope that you've been able to stop long enough to be able to breathe in this busy and chaotic season. A lot of us are trying to figure out, hey, what are we doing for Christmas? Are we going over there? Are they coming over here? Are we cooking? What should we do? Is weird aunt so-and-so going to show up? And, you know, working through all of those things. Many people, many things, many emotions at this time of year. And yet God breaks into the midst of our busyness about other things and does the best thing. Seems like they chose to focus in on the good news. So let's look at, let's kind of think through all of the, the different individuals in the uh, in that first uh, the stable that's there. So of course we have Jesus. We're going to actually talk about him last. Everybody needs a donkey, a camel, and some sheep there, and a too large of a cow. And uh, so the first one we're actually going to talk about is is Joseph. And I was thinking about Joseph. It's like. 
Well, he, it would have been very easy for him to focus in on some bad news. My girlfriend ends up pregnant. And so that's kind of strange. And, and so he'd have a lot of lists to go through of how difficult this Christmas was for him. But instead, he focuses in on the good. What was the good? Well, the very first thing is first tip off of what was going on when an angel shows up to him and specifically says to Joseph that he, you're going to have this baby and he will save his people from their sins. That seemed to be good enough for Joseph. Because anytime that angel showed up and told him to do something, the very next verse is, and he did it. He's just immediately obedient to whatever was asked of him. And so he chose to focus in on that. I don't have all the details. All I know is this baby's pretty darn special. And this baby's going to somehow, some way, going to be able to take away the sins of all mankind. And that's where he lands himself. That was Joseph's good news that I believe that that's what he was holding on to. Of course, next we have Mary. And again, there's a lot of difficulties there. He just rode a donkey for 80 miles south. Uh, to she, They didn't use her so There's no hotels that they were there. And so they find this inn, and I imagine she's thinking like any woman would be. It's just like, i got to get this baby out of me, and just all the pains of childbirth and all of that. But she seems to focus in specifically on, well, I'm thinking she's thinking, wow. Out of every woman that has ever been born, ever will be born, Messiah is coming through me. That I am God living inside of me. That I was chosen to deliver this child. <laughs> Next, uh, the shepherds are part of the, uh, the scene here. Whoops, forgot the angels there. Can't do a story without the angels. So they're actually the ones that show up, and as we read earlier, it's the one that pronounced the good news. So they're able to focus on the good news because they're the messengers, and that's exactly what the angels are, are bringing. There's born to you today a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so that's the, the good news that they're bringing. And who they shared that with were specifically the shepherds. When they told the shepherds all of this, angels, they leave after their big uh, choir. They take off, and the shepherds, let's go find them. So they went. Immediately that they went, and they saw, and the very next thing it says, they made it widely known. And so they book it out of there, and they immediately go tell everybody. That, that's what they went to do at the time. So they saw the good news, they heard the good news, and went and shared the good news as fast as they could. I was thinking about the star. They didn't have any good news. Oh, forgot the wise men. Sorry. It's been about two years. See, the wise men actually don't show up at the stable scene. They're actually a couple years later. We know that because Herod, Herod wants to kill all of the, figured out the time, and wants to kill all the boys under age two because he had figured in the coming of the wise men, when they had talked with him about it, it was about a two-year time period. And so they're actually showing up. They're still in the area. They're actually in a house at the time. But that's where the wise men are showing up at that time, a little bit later. But with that, I'm thinking, what are they, how are they going to focus in on? They bring their gold, their frankincense, and their myrrh. But what they're excited about is they finally found, they have a long journey from the east, but they finally found the king of the Jews. And so they present their gold to him as king. And so they <laughs> present that. Next is the star. What does the star do? What does the star say? It focuses on the good news, because all it has to do is point, right? However, the star did it, but he shined his light on, there's the baby right down there. And so that's all it had to do, to point the way, right? To point to Jesus, which is what we all should do with our lives, right? Just be like that star, just point to Jesus. That, that's all it had to do. That's what was its good news. A couple others in that story that we have, just a little bit later in the story, is a guy named Simeon. He's down at the temple. And Mary and Joseph bring baby Jesus for his baby dedication. And they bring him down there. And all of a sudden, this old man walks up named Simeon and grabs the baby out of their arms, which is kind of scary for their mom and dad. But he takes, and but he had made this commitment to the Lord. He had heard from the Lord that before he would die, he'd be able to see Messiah. And so it's just like he sees his baby. He knows it's Messiah right away. How do you know? I don't know. God just prompted him that, that he knew this. And he says, I, I, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to die. That's I just wanted to see Messiah. There's another lady. Her name was Anna. She was at the, uh, at the temple site there also. And she had said that specifically to her good news, she spoke of him, Jesus, to all those who look for redemption in Jerusalem. And so she was thrilled to death to be able to, uh, uh, to share that. 
I say from the actual city of Bethlehem. It, it, the, the, the good news was brought to it. You and I, we wouldn't be talking about Bethlehem. It was this little podunk little hamlet just about two miles north of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a big city. That's where everything happened there. And so it wasn't little Bethlehem. The only reason we know of Bethlehem is because it was placed in the Bible. It was here that their city, that city was chosen. And of all the cities of the world, to proclaim Messiah. It said, you, Bethlehem, out of you shall come a ruler. Their city was chosen. Next, the world's good news. Why was it good news to the whole world? Well, it was good news that will bring great joy to all people. That's what the angels had said when they were up in the sky talking to the shepherds there. To all people. Not just to the Jews, but to all people groups, all ethne, all the ethnic groups, to everyone in the world. And so, to the world, they got this good news. Lastly, we have Jesus. He's the star of our story here. He had the good news. He brought the good news. He was the good news. And he still is the good news. So that's what he's all about, right? <clears throat> Interesting, whenever an extraterrestrial comes, anytime an angel showed up and talked to somebody, what's the first thing out of his mouth? Don't be what? Afraid, right? Because they're obviously shaking in their boots over this angelic creature that shows up. And so every angel showing up is always saying, hey, don't be afraid. So Jesus never has to say to anybody, Jesus, don't be afraid. And yet he's God. He's more than an angel. He's God himself. But who's ever been afraid of a baby? And so he, he comes in this form. He comes in this form as a baby because nobody's afraid of a baby. Some say, I could, if I could just see God. Well, that's what this first Christmas is all about. The incarnation. God taking on human flesh. People saying, I just wish I could see God. That's what that event was for. So you could see God in the flesh. Somebody that was tangible to them. And so he came to proclaim him. So he came to redeem and he came to, to rescue. So let me ask you, what is your good news this Christmas? What's your good news? Strip away all of the, the bad news, all the hard things that are happening in your life right now. And can you focus in on what is your good news? Maybe you can focus in on kindness and love. How many people saw the new Grinch movie? Can I see a show of hands? I got to see it. At the very end, thank you, Scorsese family, we went with them. And at the big, one of the very last phrases in this, he raises, the Grinch raises a toast. And he specifically says, it's a short line, to kindness and love, the things we need most. I whipped out my phone, I said, ooh, that's good. I just put it down there. That's all I just want to share that with you. To kindness and love, the things we need most. And in fact, that's what this world is. And so how do I focus in on that? How do I make that part of my life? Or maybe you can focus in on the Coles commercial, what their little Christmas jingle was this year. Anybody know what it was? Come on, give it to me. Give joy, get joy, right? Anytime Kelly and I heard it, we tried to say it faster than they could. Give joy, get joy. And the two we both try to out say it quicker than the other friends, anyways. Now, you know, so whatever it is, what are you going to focus in on? Again, we could, we could just spend the time just looking at everything bad and listing all of those things out, or we can focus in on. Lord, what is good? And if you're frustrated right now and you're sitting there, there's been a death in the family or some hard things that you're going through with work or uh, finances or whatever it is, and, and maybe you're just going, thanks, preacher boy, but no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not buying it. Maybe you just need to take that time. Maybe you just need to breathe and to be able to think through, is there anything good this Christmas season that I can focus in on? I challenge you to, uh, to do that. We're talking about the gospel of Christmas. This is my absolute favorite Definition, if you will. And uh, this is by Timothy Keller. He says, The essence of the gospel is that we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we're more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. This is it. It, it. it gives both sides of it. It gives the bad news and the good news immediately together with that. That we are sinners of sin. We've broken God's laws. We've broken his heart. And in the midst of that, seeing, but he's so love and accepting us and so if we repent and believe we can have a relationship with him and so beautifully just connects to, together there a little illustration here thought it'd be good for the kids adults you can listen in if you want to 
The little yellow ball represents God. The black ball represents man. And so God, in all of his holiness and all of his perfection, as he comes and in, out of his great love, he makes man in his image, right? And, but in, and in the midst of that, why, why he did this is he wanted to be in fellowship with man. Walking with them, kind of like with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden, in the cool of the day, and, and walking with them. And it was all a, about this, but what had taken place is man decides to be separate from God because of sin. And what takes place here is this sin ultimately separates us from God. And in this separation, it causes this not right in the middle. I don't know if you guys can see that way in the back back there. But what happens there is this, this separation, this permanent separation, this separation that we can't do anything about. There's no way to get on the other side of the knot, to make the knot go away. We can't be good enough. We can't do enough good deeds to make up for bad deeds. That is a problem, and you and I, we can't do anything about it. But God comes up with what we called earlier Plan B. And what he did is, it's about Jesus. And so, Jesus comes from heaven, and he sends him down to earth. Get on the side of it. That won't work for you, cross. Okay. And in the midst of it there, we have Jesus. Who comes and lives this perfect life and then dies for us, buried three days, rises from the dead. And in the midst of it, he's the only one that can deal with the knot. And it goes away. And with that, we have this fellowship with him. And we're back in unity with him and having a relationship with him. That's pretty good on that. Yeah. I <laughs> But I think it's a good illustration, right? Last year, you didn't remember anything in my, everybody came up and said, I love your rope analogy. So I, okay, I've got to find another rope analogy somewhere in there. Let's make us remember things. Jesus has gone back into heaven. And he desires for us to join him. Heaven is a perfect place. Up in heaven, there's no inconsistencies. It's, it's perfect. And only perfect people are allowed. But I don't know about you, but I missed out on perfection a long time ago, right? One in a million chance of me being perfect and, like I said, blew it a long time ago in that. That ain't going to happen. So God came up with plan B. And it is, in fact, the, the gospel, the, the good news. And he, he sent us a savior. We can get in on somebody else's ticket. The good news is that the Savior has been born. Just a couple analogies and then I'll wrap up here. It's just like with lifeguarding. You can't save somebody as long as they're trying to save themselves. As they're thrashing about trying to save themselves, if you get too close to them, they're just going to climb on top of you and try to take you down out of fear and everything else. So if you've ever did lifeguarding before, you just back up. You can go up and smack them once and you can do some other maneuvers, but, but normally you just back off just until they're too tired and they give up. And then right before they're going down, they say help, and then you move in and you help them. If you're trying to do it on your own, if you're trying to save yourself, the Lord's just going to back off and let you do it as much as you want to. Try to be as good as you want. Everything else, he's just backing off. And until you cry out to him and say, I need your help, that's when he swoops in and rescues you like a lifeguard. I'll end with this story. One Christmas, a uh, grandmother couldn't decide what to give her three grandchildren. And so uh, didn't know what to buy them. So she writes out three checks for $20 and puts them in a card. And in the card, it says, buy your own gift. And she mails them off with a check, puts it in there, and mails it off. And the next day, she finds the three checks on her counter and realized she didn't put them in with the card. <laughs> so the three grandchildren, don't get ahead of me here. The three grandchildren <laughs> open up their cards and it says, what? Buy your own gift. <laughs> here's, the, here's the startling truth of the gospel. Jesus has purchased our redemption. He doesn't say, buy it on your own. No way. That's the gospel of Christmas. It's been paid for. We simply need to receive that. Pretty simple, huh? That's the story of Christmas. That's the gospel of Christmas. That's the good news of Christmas. I'd like to give, uh, as I wrap up in prayer, the team comes back up. Uh, uh, I'd like to give an